Suava, and uh, <clears throat> thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me here today. And I'm uh, uh, very excited because it's my first trip to Poland, uh, uh, going around and seeing stuff and having a very good time. Uh, so I um, uh, want to talk today about uh, the continuing influence of the, uh, the ideas in the Polish peasant uh, for the study of ethnicity and immigration in American society today. Um, the, uh, to just give you a pre preview of my overall argument, uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about the historical comparison of the two moments, 1918 and 2018, uh, and, and talk about a few similarities that we are facing uh, uh, in this historical moment. Then I think I'll go through some of the highlights of the, the theoretical and methodological contributions of Thomas and Janecki that I experience in my work and that I think uh, 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 are still very much influential in the study of ethnicity and immigration. And uh, then I uh, will give you a very fast tour of immigration and ethnicity in the last 100 years, uh, talk a little bit about what I'm worried about in the next 100 years, <laughs> or actually I'm worried about in the next two or three years, um, and uh, then I'm going to come back to some of their broader, their broader uh, contributions to American sociology and how we think about uh, things, and I'm going to come back to that uh, theme if I have time at the end to talk a little bit about changes, I think, in some of our methods and our um, scope of work uh, as sociologists. So, 1918 and 2018. Um, are similar, you know, un unlike in some ways, but uh, in both cases, uh, there are really peaks of income inequality. Um, 1918 um, uh, was, was in the, the buildup to uh, the highest point of inequality, which was right before the Depression. Uh, this is just the top 1% share. I could put up Gini coefficients, I could put up other things, but basically uh, we're in the period right now of really heightened income inequality that shows no signs of breaks going forward. Uh, and it was also true uh, in 1918. Also, um, 1918 was in the midst of the largest wave of immigration uh, to the U.S. Um, uh, and uh, immigrants were coming uh, uh, between 1818, uh, 1880 and 1920 from Southern and Central Europe. Uh, and uh, you see the dip there that was from our, uh, restricting immigration. Uh, so actually, uh, we, we hit the highest percentage of the U.S. population that was um, uh, immigrant or first generation, uh, over 14% uh, in 1920, right before we shut the doors to immigration. Uh, then it was quite low, and then after 1965, it began to um, rise again. And we're almost, of course, the numbers are greater, but we're almost about to hit uh, the percentage that we were at that earlier period. Uh, so in 1918 and 2018, we were facing very high levels of inequality and very high levels of immigration. And in both cases, uh, the, um, uh, the ideology of nati nativism was uh, ascendant. And so nativists were very much uh, looking to immigration uh, as a, a social problem. Uh, so the move to restrict immigration was in full force in 1918. Uh, the Dillingham Commission, which was a congressional commission looking into restricting immigration, was hard at work during this period. Uh, and by 1924, the, the last in the series of restrictive immigration laws uh, uh, was passed, and it really shut the door to immigration from Southern and Central Europe. The Dillingham Commission heard a lot of testimony. It had 27 volumes, and a lot of the testimony was about the biological inferiority of the immigrants who were coming. So experts, uh, including sociologists, testified to the commission about the low IQs of people from Southern and Central Europe. Uh, the biological inferiority of immigrants from Poland was specifically measured by their head circumference, and they compared the head circumference of people from uh, uh, Eastern and Southern Europe with uh, the bigger heads from Northern and Western Europe and showed that this was uh, their, their lower IQ. 
Uh, one expert testified to the commission that 66.9%, uh, really very you know, accurate statistic, of Polish Jews and 63.6% .6 of Italians in American schools were mentally retarded. Um, so there was a lot of biologism uh, ascendant in uh, the nativism of the time. Uh, we have a, a similar uh, nativism right now in the United States, and here's a quote from John Kelly, who is the former head of Homeland Security, which is in charge of immigration. Uh, uh, and he's now the chief of staff to Trump in the White House. And he said two weeks ago, just two weeks ago, that undocumented Latino immigrants are not people that would easily assimilate into the United States, into our modern society. They're all overwhelmingly rural people, i.e. peasants. Uh, in the countries they come from, fourth, fifth grade educations are kind of the norm. They don't speak English, obviously, that's a big thing and they don't integrate well, they don't have skills. So this is the reason why uh, uh, he thinks that they should be uh, rounded up and deported. So the Polish peasant in 1918, uh, and I do want to say that uh, Thomas had a very uh, sophisticated understanding, I think, of uh, immigration, immigrant exploitation, because when I was preparing for this talk, I realized that they wrote uh, these thousands of pages in just two years. Uh, Zemecki wrote most of it, but Thomas's name went first. So if you actually want to get the job done, you hire an immigrant and you take all the credit. <laughs> um, so what they did was in their in their um, in their work was to reject the social Darwinism of the time. And they very much wanted to establish sociology as uh, something separate and uh, uh, worthy uh, and apart from biology. So they were setting up sociology as its own discipline. And Norbert Wiley, who, who can't be here, but uh, his 1986 uh, book, uh, not book, uh, his 1986 article um, really uh, lays out some of these arguments about uh, what they actually accomplished. Uh, he says they had to, to liberate the individual from the biological swamp. Um, they had to uh, say that the individual could be studied by sociologists and the relationship between the individual and society was the main purpose of sociology. Um, and in addition to uh, establishing that as a subject of study, they also rejected the Lamarckian idea that there was a genetic inheritance of social traits, uh, that somehow uh, having been in backward situations, you would adopt these uh, social traits and they would come with you uh, into your new uh, situation. So culture was not biologically rooted for Thomas and Zanecki. Meaning was created by the interaction of the individual with the society. Uh, and they used the two uh, 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 concepts they came up with, attitude at the individual level and value at the social level. And the two arenas of meaning are in conflict with each other sometimes. Um, and international migration is but the most extreme example of this, right? So uh, social change comes about when individuals and societies interact, and the most extreme case is somebody who's come in with a totally different set of attitudes and confronts a totally different set of values. Um, social change is very much at the heart of what they were writing about. Uh, how could uh, the Polish peasants change, and also how was the society going to be changed by them coming? Um, so the, this joint construction of, of meaning, which was later really fully developed into symbolic interactionism, uh, was very uh, nascent uh, in this book. So they also were, uh, as, as Suave suggested, they were also really thinking about public policy, right? This is a time of trying to restrict immigration. And they were really coping with the, the big question, one of the big questions of the time is how do we cope with all of these different groups coming from throughout the world, living in close proximity with each other. And their solution is that the ethnic self is a malleable self and that uh, immigrants can change and that um, intergroup communication and tolerance was necessary, and that with time, um, there would be assimilation. 
So the idea was uh, that this interaction between the individual, the ethnic group, and society would lead to the social change that would lead to assimilation of the Polish immigrants. So Wiley describes the embedded thesis of the book in terms I, I really liked. He said, if Poles define themselves as American, then they will become American, even though the denying and consequenting might take some time. The definition of the situation, as Thomas was later to uh, uh, famously say, is then in part the creation of the situation. On this premise, the American Poles and all the other new ethnics had the psychological capacity to assimilate over time to American life. So the ethnic group in this theory uh, that they developed was not an impediment to assimilation, but in fact was the source of strength for the individual as they uh, encountered the new society. And it allowed the social change, both from above and from below. And the letters were their vehicle for understanding how people struggled with this, this, uh, this contradiction between attitudes and values. And the letters were the empirical uh, foundation that they used of looking at this interaction in real time, basically, as a change. So if you think about the three paradigms we currently use in uh, uh, sociology, to understand immigrant incorporation, all three are really resting on a bedrock from the Polish peasant. So if you think about new assimilation theory, which is associated with Richard Alba and Victor Nee, uh, the idea of new assimilation theory is that integration or assimilation is a two-way process, that uh, society changes, immigrants change, and the interaction between them is how social change. Um, if you look at segmented assimilation by Alejandro Cortez and Min Zhao and other collaborators uh, with uh, Alex on this, uh, the, the main point really is that ethnicity is uh, necessary. The ethnic group is a necessary bulwark against the negative aspects of American society. So people who are too quickly alienated from their ethnic group uh, have downward mobility, but those who are enveloped in the ethnic group have a clearer path into American society. And then finally, as, as Michael uh, uh, made a very strong case for uh, earlier uh, today, uh, transnationalism, which uh, it is a very uh, important perspective in uh, understanding immigration today, uh, evident in the works of Nina Glick-Schiller, uh, anthropologist, Peggy Levin, sociologist, who look at the continuing ties between sending and receiving societies. And uh, uh, Peggy's important um, uh, intervention of social remittances of the ideas and concepts and basically attitudes and values which are shipped back to the sending society and then reinterpreted and then come forward. So all of these um, uh, uh, theories that we use now are really very much, you can see the continuity uh, with uh, the Polish peasant. So, now I'll switch and, and talk a little bit about the empirical story of 20th century um, US assimilation. So, uh, uh, the um, story after 1918 and after the, um, the, uh, stop, uh, the stopping of immigration because of all of these uh, incredibly inferior people who were coming in uh, between 1880 and 1920 is that there was uh, assimilation, um, what, People have called straight line assimilation, where each generation does better than the generation before it. And uh, there was very clear uh, progress for uh, these immigrants and their children and grandchildren. In the 1960s and 70s, uh, sociologists were, uh, and other social scientists were concerned, well, uh, if they're assimilating so much, why aren't they giving up their ethnic identities? Um, and then there was uh, Blazer Moynihan wrote a book in the 1960s, Beyond the Melting Pot. Uh, people were writing about the unmeltable ethnic. And in fact, uh, there was a great deal of assimilation, but the uh, ethnic label or the ethnic identity uh, persisted even after it didn't make much difference in everyday life. There was widespread intermarriage and uh, what I called ethnic options. People were choosing among the ethnicities in their past. So in 
So here's uh, something that you can still buy online, which is um, uh, little onesies for your Italian-American children and grandchildren, which celebrate uh, Italian-American identity. Um, so it took several generations, but the Italians, the Irish, the Polish immigrants achieved parity in incomes and education, and in fact began to surpass the native-born uh, American whites. Um, Andrew Greeley called this an ethnic miracle, um, and historians who have looked carefully at this really uh, emphasize a number of factors uh, of rising income equality, uh, not inequality, um, and the importance of wars, especially uh, World War I and World War II, in uh, fostering a, sen a sense of inclusive Americanness. Uh, so you can see um, uh, these are World War I uh, ads for uh, liberty bonds, um, and they are very much stressing that immigrants are Americans and owe their uh, money and their allegiance uh, to the American war effort. Um, and you can see uh, the honor roll of people who are giving to this uh, not only includes all of the Eastern European names and the Irish names, but it also has, uh, at the end, uh, Gonzalez, who was, uh, I guess, the token Mexican who was giving some money. Mm -hmm. So by 1990, intermarriage was widespread. More than half of whites had spouses whose ethnic backgrounds did not overlap with their own at all. Uh, by 2018, people don't even know uh, who their ancestors are, who came from Europe, but 23andMe and other genetics organizations will, uh, will take your money and your saliva and tell you uh, where your uh, relatives are from. Only 20% of spouses had uh, uh, identical uh, backgrounds in 1990. Um, so the end point was a symbolic ethnicity. People enjoyed their ethnicity, had a little impact on their day-to-day -day life. It was voluntary. Uh, given the choice, people would choose the most ethnic in their background as opposed to trying to assimilate into the least ethnic identity. Uh, English was less popular. Polish, Italian uh, was more popular uh, when you had uh, options to choose from. So European immigrants uh, achieved all of this. Uh, they enjoyed the expansion of the economy between World War II and the 1970s. Uh, they uh, also were white, and so they were uh, included uh, uh, on the backs of the people who were excluded, blacks and uh, Hispanics um, and Asians. Um, so uh, uh, immigrants now, uh, are facing a very different economy. So uh, you can think about immigrants who came from uh, Europe uh, in the earlier period, and they were very much uh, facing um, uh, rising um, uh, uh, wages. They were getting on an escalator that was going up. And currently, uh, immigrants are getting on an escalator that's going down. Uh, real wages are falling for everyone with less than uh, a high school education. So uh, the question was, are we worried about uh, a lack of assimilation? And um, uh, uh, in recent, uh, last year, I published, um, I led a, a group of 18 scholars across the social sciences in a National Academy of Sciences report looking at immigrant integration in the US now. Um, looking at whether or not immigrants are assimilating, uh, how are they doing in the economy, and in lots of different ways. We defined integration as a two-way exchange um, uh, measured across time and intergenerationally. And we not only looked at integration, how are immigrants and um, uh, Americans becoming like each other, but also on the concept of well-being. Do immigrants, are they better off from uh, becoming Americans. Um, and so we measured that as well. And we looked across many, many dimensions. We looked at socioeconomic, cultural, political, uh, spatial integration, family, health integration. And the quick summary is that immigrants are integrating as fast or faster than the European immigrants who came a century before. Um, immigrants and their children uh, are one out of four US residents. Um, they are, uh, on every dimension that we measured, every single one, 
They were becoming more like um, native-born Americans with the longer number of years they were here and across generations. Um, and on the whole, integration is good for you. And on the whole, you're better off uh, uh, as you become more American. You have higher education. You have uh, better incomes. You have less poverty. Uh, but there were three areas where there was um, a, a decline in um, uh, well-being by becoming American, and that is health, crime, and family forming. So immigrants generally are very unhealthy, and immigrants come in and they have longer life expectancy, better health behaviors, uh, better uh, outcomes on all kinds of health uh, dimensions, and the longer they're here, the sicker they become, and they become more like native born. so by the second or third generation, they are just as unhealthy as the rest of America. Um, crime. Uh, and this is something that our president has not learned and that most Americans don't really understand. But in terms of crime, uh, immigrants commit crimes at one-fourth the rate of uh, native-born Americans of their same age uh, and gender. And they are uh, much, much less likely to commit all kinds of crime, violent and nonviolent crime. And over time, they converge with native-born Americans. So by the second and third generation, they look just alike. And family form, the children of immigrants are the most likely to grow up with two parents. Um, and uh, they are the most likely to uh, uh, not divorce, to not have children out of wedlock, and to um, uh, grow up in intact families. By the second and third generation, they look just like other Americans. Uh, educational attainment is really dramatic. So for instance, um, among Mexican American men, um, if you look at uh, the first generation, they average an eighth grade education. If you look at the second generation, uh, they average a high school education. Uh, that's much more rapid educational assimilation than you found among uh, Poles and Italians earlier. Um, in terms of employment, earnings, poverty, I'm going fast now, all of it is uh, uh, progress over time. It's still racially stratified. So whites and Asians are at the top, blacks and Hispanics are much lower, but for all of them there is this progression the longer they're in the U.S. and the better, um, uh, uh, and, and the more generations. In terms of language, there's rapid language assimilation, much faster than before. Most Americans have no idea about this. Uh, in fact, uh, the one difference is that Spanish tends to stick around to extra generations, so people become more bilingual if their parents were uh, Spanish speakers. Uh, but most Americans don't have any clue that you could actually speak two languages, and it's not a zero-sum game. Uh, so they're quite upset about this. Uh, but in fact, there's rapid uh, use of English, and uh, language acquisition uh, is quicker than it was historically. There's also very high levels of intermarriage across the major racial and ethnic um, categories in the US, and immigrants are very much contributing to that uh, change. So 35% of Americans now report that they have a close kin member who is a member of a different racial group. So that's a very high percentage of um, uh, intermixing among people. So let me just uh, say, the worry going forward is legal status. So we now have 11.3 million uh, undocumented immigrants in the US who have very few rights. They are currently uh, being subject to a terror of deportation. Uh, this disproportionately uh, impacts immigrant groups, especially Mexican-Americans. Um, and undocumented status is a failure no matter which way you look at it, because it does not stop people from integrating. They're marrying, they're going to church, they're working, they're buying houses. Uh, but it does stop them from fully integrating. So it puts them into this limbo state where they have very few rights, yet they're long-term members of American society. Uh, there's been no net uh, undocumented immigration since 2008. Uh, you also wouldn't know that listening to the news. Um, and uh, there's been a growth of settled families. Because no new people are coming in, the average person has been here a long time and has formed a family and is a settled member of um, uh, American society. So 61% of undocumented people have been here 10 years or more. Um, and you can see uh, that it's really 
quite dramatic that the number of undocumented people, the percentage, uh, are very long-term settlers in the US. 5.2 million children are the children of the undocumented. Uh, 4.5 million are US citizens, and they suffer all kinds of uh, psychological, behavioral, and school effects from their parents' undocumented status. And uh, there are about 8% of all US born children, and um, there are a very large percentage of kids in schools. So, uh, let me just say, we're spending a lot of money on immigration, and we also are detaining a lot of people. So we detain, uh, which really is a nice word for in prison, uh, 34,000 people a night. We have a quota set by Congress that 34,000 people have to be in prison every night for immigration detention. Um, uh, and the numbers, uh, uh, this includes children and, and uh, whole families who are put into detention, some for very long periods of time. Deportations have soared, um, and we deport uh, almost a uh, half a million people uh, every year. Um, so, let me just um, uh, conclude by talking about some of the issues that I'm worried about going forward. Um, first of all, the optimism of Thomas and Zanecki was correct for the European uh, immigrants who came. Uh, the role of declining income inequality and what Richard Alba has called non-zero-sum mobility, that, we can, that your children can progress and that doesn't mean that our children will suffer when you, um, they progress, uh, is very important. But really, I can't stress enough that we're in a different ballgame now with the, Latin, with the legal restrictions that we have. And legal status is really a new form of stratification in American society. It's being mirrored in other societies around the world. And it is a new form of um, uh, denial of rights. Um, in the US, there, we deny 11.3 million people rights because they are undocumented immigrants. And 20 million people, we do not deny rights because they're ex-felons. And they also can't vote in some states, and they can't have public housing. And they, there's really a, a parallel track of denial, legal denial of, of rights, which is operating under the radar in American society. So some difficult questions we face going forward is how do we re re reverse rising income inequality without a depression and a world war that did it the last time? Um, uh, how do we redirect the populist anger that is occurring away from immigrants and refugees and towards the obscene wealth um, that continues to grow and concentrate? Um, support for Trump is very much uh, concentrated in the 30% of Americans who uh, are worried about immigration. They're a minority, but they're a very uh, organized and uh, vocal minority. Uh, it's uh, very much crucial to his base, uh, and uh, it is very much uh, not something he's going to uh, get rid of voluntarily. So I want to end just by saying a little bit about the future of sociology and some of the uh, contributions <coughs> that uh, Thomas and Zanecki made to uh, uh, what we study. And uh, the first point I would make is that biology is back. Um, and that I don't think we should uh, be trying to differentiate ourselves from biology anymore. Uh, the science of epigenetics, I think, is incredibly important for sociology. And uh, what that actually shows is what Thomas and Zanecki were denying, basically, which is that um, uh, scientists now can see that if your grandmother had a stressful life, that turns on and off different genes that you experience and can create uh, uh, a different pattern of diseases for you uh, three generations later. Um, so uh, there are ways in which not only do, are we creatures of our environment, but our environment gets embodied into us. And so what I think that says is we need sociologists to really understand how social life and social structure affects the individual. Uh, because that is very much, uh, it's affecting life and death, it's affecting how, how we live, and we cannot leave it to biologists with their very crude and uh, uh, undeveloped understanding of how to measure uh, the world. 
Um, secondly, immigrants are not writing letters back home anymore. Um, they're emailing and they're tweeting and they're doing Google searches and all kinds of things that actually we need to learn uh, uh, and we need to use not only uh, the tools that we have, which include ethnography, which Michael was uh, a very uh, persuasive uh, um, uh, ambassador for earlier, but we also need to be able to use big data, we need to be able to use electronic traces, all kinds of new ways of understanding uh, the uh, traces that immigrants leave about how they go through this process of becoming American again. So that's it.